Hey everyone, this is Mike with Buzz Talks, and today we're going to be doing our breakdown and review to Episode 9, the finale of HBO's Watchmen. It's going to have a ton of spoilers for the episode here, so go watch it if you haven't yet. I thought it was an amazing episode, which nicely tied up all of the plots. So much happened here, so let's just jump right into it. We started with a flashback to November 1st, 1985 with Vite making his video to Robert Redford, which we saw Looking Glass watching in episode 5. We see that his base of operations in Karnak is manned by Vietnamese refugees. Three of these guys were actually shown in the original comic book with Vite on Karnak. These are likely the three recording his video here. Adrian ends up poisoning them in the comic, killing all of the witnesses right before he sent the giant squid to Manhattan. So at the same time as he's making this video, we see that Lady True's mother, Bianne, was one of these servants. She breaks into Veidt's office and accesses his computer using the same code, Ramses II, that Night Owl used in the graphic novel to hack into Adrian's computer. And for history buffs, Ozymandias is the Greek name for the Egyptian king Ramses II. Bian accessed a stash of sperm that Adrian was keeping. Apparently he had thousands of vials of the stuff. He was a very busy guy. I guess as a way of keeping his genetic material in case he wanted to one day reproduce. Bian quotes the real-life historic Lady True of the 3rd century in this scene who is famous for leading a rebellion against the Chinese who are attempting to take control of Vietnam. Bian injects herself with the sperm saying, Fuck you, Ozymandias, as a way of showing her contempt for him as a master, and perhaps her striking a blow at imperialism and fascism. We then flash to 2008, and Lady True approaching Veidt's sanctuary, Karnak. He tries to send her away, but she appeals to his vanity and gains access by stating that she knew all about what he did in 1985, and that she agreed with what he did. She strokes his ego by saying that it's a shame that no one can give him the credit that he deserves for his plans and for what he did. We learn that Redford cut off all communication with Veidt, saying that he didn't need Veidt's help to become president, and Veidt makes a little reference here to Ronald Reagan by saying that it would be absurd for a cowboy actor to become president. We learn more about the squid showers which will come into play later, that they are set on random automated system so that the, anyone investigating any kind of pattern wouldn't be able to find one. True is impressed with what Veidt is doing, um, but she thinks that Vite isn't doing enough. Lady True hints at Dr. Manhattan being the key to getting rid of the world's nuclear weapons. Vite states that she thinks he's got some sort of hotline to him. Th and that little bit of dialogue there is where Lady True comes up with the idea of making an actual hotline booth to Dr. Manhattan on Mars, which brought great wealth to her, which she needed, um, and allowed her to at the same time spy on humanity's fears and prayers. She tells Vite something that he doesn't know, that Dr. Manhattan is on Mars, uh, though the Dr. Manhattan on Mars is a decoy, also set to predetermined patterns just like his squid showers. She's developed a device to track his powers and she's got a ping on Europa. She sent a probe to Europa and in 5 years, 72 days, 9 hours and 17 minutes, that probe will take photos of the moon and send them back to Earth so that she can see Manhattan's precise location and what he's doing there. And we get this flashback scene showing that this was actually the precise moment that Veidt looked up at the probe back in episode 5. And this was a great bit of storytelling here tying those two episodes together. And I love the background Claire de Lune music playing which we had in the last episode on Europa. True then reveals her ultimate plan and she does it much earlier than I thought in the episode. She's the one who wants to destroy Manhattan and take his power. She has altruistic plans though. She wants to get rid of the nukes, feed the starving, clean the air. Things she thought Dr. Manhattan should have done. She's invented a quantum centrifuge to transfer Manhattan's powers, but she doesn't have the money to build it. So she's actually there to ask Vite for $42 billion. She reveals to Veidt that she is in fact his daughter, but Veidt is unwilling to give her the money. When we get some of Veidt's backstory here, as revealed in the comics where he inherited a lot of wealth, but then he gave it away in order to prove to himself and to everyone else that he could achieve anything starting from nothing. So that's what he gives her, nothing. Um, he, he refuses to accept her as a daughter and gives her nothing, and I saw this as a test by Veidt to see if she's actually worthy of him as a daughter. 
We then flash to Europa invites main storyline, and it seems as if another year has gone by since our last episode. Vite makes a final wish on his year-old cake, and then a true spaceship arrives. Vite escapes from his prison from a tunnel he must have dug out with his short horseshoe at the end of the last episode, and he, we get our final showdown with the game's warden. The warden shoots Vite after warning him to stay back, and Vite then does the same trick he did in 1985 in the graphic novel. He catches the bullet in midair, showing the amazing skills that he's got. Vite kills the game's warden and reveals that the warden's role there uh, was actually created by Vite as a means to create a worthy adversary for himself. It was a bit of entertainment so that he wouldn't be bored to the point of insanity there. The warden dies and again we see Adrian's lack of emotion for Dr. Manhattan's creations. They were subjects used for his adoration and nothing more. He flies off on the automated ship and we see that he's actually spelt out save me daughter on the surface of the moon everyone was theorizing what it was showing and that shows just how desperate he was to leave the place he would acknowledge true as his daughter and be humbled in his pleas for help he's put into suspended animation and congrats to anyone who thought that it was in fact him trapped in that frozen statue in lady true's vivarium i didn't think it was i thought it was a little too far out there but that's this show everything is far out there it's awesome we then cut to bian on thawing vite after the events of the last episode true wants him to be there to see her ultimate plans come to pass vite then plays our observer role in Lady True unveiling her plans and we have this oddly almost touching moment between the two of them as he says you actually built it referring to the foreboding quantum centrifuge clock um, and in, he says it's beautiful to which she replies thank you we then have our endearing newsstand man who interacts with True and Vite, and I'm glad we got to see him again. I wish we'd actually had more of him. The newsstand character, there's a similar newsstand character in the comics, and he was meant to give us a perspective of kind of your everyday regular person, the people who are actually affected by all of the, on the ground, by all the plans of people in power, the ones who were hurt by the Watchmen. He tells Vite that no one really cares much about Ozymandias anymore. And then we see that amazingly creepy orb passing overhead with great background music, and Vite begins quoting the Merneptah Stele. And this is essentially an ancient Egyptian document from uh, 1208 BC, and it's our oldest written reference to Israel that we have, which details the Pharaoh Merneptah's conquest of the areas east of Egypt. He's essentially telling the newsstand man that the end is coming. Because um, in that Merneptah Stile, it's just all about the destruction of all these places. And this is the reckoning that we've had mentioned throughout the show. We then cut to Senator Keene and the senior members of the evil Cyclops group assembling to see Keene's final plans come through. Agent Lori Blake is still there tied up. And we finally have Looking Glass show up disguised in that Rorschach mask. And he's there to help Lori escape. The scene is all happening at the same time as the last scene in episode 8. So we see what happens when Dr. Manhattan is hit with that beam. He gets transported into a cage made of synthetic lithium. And this was made from the watch batteries we saw the 7th Cavalry members collecting in episode 1. The beam has caused Dr. Manhattan uh, to keep jumping around within his own timeline. He can't stay present mentally. And we see him repeating a lot of lines from the original comic book. From different moments in his life. Keen goes into a speech talking about what Redford has done as a president and it speaks to some of the fears of the right wing. They've had their guns taken away, etc. He also ends up wearing one of Docker Manhattan's outfits in this scene, which you might recognize, uh, which he wore before he'd just get naked all the time. And Laurie makes fun of him about about his underwear that he's wearing. We learn that they discovered Dr. Manhattan's presence in Tulsa after the White Knight when one of their members who attacked the Abar home was transported to Gila Flats. This was the place where John Osterman became Dr. Manhattan. After the events of the White Knight, Judd tried to get closer to the Abar family so that the Cyclops group could figure out what's actually going on there. Angela then shows up after getting the location of where everyone is from the last 7th Cavalry member in front of her house. She tries to stop Keen by telling him that Lady True is setting them all up. 
that she's two steps ahead of them, but Keen doesn't listen. He steps into the device, thinking that it's going to turn him into Dr. Manhattan. The device actually transports them all to the city square of Tulsa, where True forces quickly disarm the confused 7th Cavalry members. True takes control of the situation, and we discover that Keen was completely obliterated by the device. True fulfills her promise to Will Reeves and kills all of the members of Cyclops. And in the confusion, Dr. Manhattan makes contact with the pool of blood which used to be Senator Keene. This gives him a connection beyond his cage and his power flows out, transporting Lori, Looking Glass, and Vite to Antarctica, to Karnak. Dr. Manhattan knows his fate. He can't save himself and he wants to spend his final moments with Angela. True's device kills him, and we flash through Cal and Angela's relationship, and we feel the enormity of the moment of his death as Angela is blown back in the blast. At the same time as we have this highly emotional scene, we have some great banter at Karnak between Lori and Vite, where they catch up, and while Looking Glass tries to confront Ozymandias about his role in the events of 1985, Vite brushes Looking Glass off. He's beneath him. And he finally gets to shine in the moment he's dreamed of in all of his time on Europa. He puts himself again into that role as the ultimate watchman, the savior of humankind. His children, he called humanity in the last episode. Vite knows his own arrogance. He's, he's very cognizant of it, but he sees Lady True as someone who's even worse than himself. He's a narcissist, but he's never gone as far as trying to become God, trying to take Dr. Manhattan's powers. He knows that it's hubris and doomed to fail and that anyone who would seek out that kind of power is ultimately doing it for selfish reasons. Vite uses his transporter to send a shower of frozen squid this time, which is going to devastate five city blocks in Tulsa. And we see the reaction that Looking Glass and Lori have to it. Lori turns away. They know it's wrong. They know people are going to die, but they have to go along with it. They, le they let Vite do what he thinks he has to do to save humanity. The police then show up at the square, and I love that shot of that first squid passing through True's hand and her realization of what's happened. It was a great death scene for the character as she's crushed by her own device, literally the architect of her own destruction. Blake calls Angela to warn her and Bian about the squid storm, and Angela flees to a movie theater. Inside sits Will Reeves, and we end here where we started in that same theater which was in the first scene of episode one. Will reminds us of that opening scene and Bass Reeves as his original inspiration in becoming a police officer. He tells us that he hid his face as Hooded Justice not out of anger but out of fear and that hiding in the mask didn't solve anything. Angela's children are there sleeping in the theater and Will's been there looking after them ever since they've been transported there by Dr. Manhattan. We learn that Will's involvement with Lady True was all a plan devised by Dr. Manhattan, who must have had a larger conversation with Will years ago. Will tells Angela that Dr. Manhattan had to die, and Manhattan uh, told Will to say that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, as a hint to her that she'll understand later on. And we finally get our heartwarming scene in this show. Angela invites Will to stay with them, only for a few days, but I think it's going to end up being a permanent thing here. The guy's definitely family now. We then switch to Vite and get a great ending for his storyline. He offers Lori and Looking Glass Night Owl's Archie ship to get back home, and Lori says that Vite is under arrest for the events of 1985. He's surprised. He erupts in this indignant speech here, and we get a little reference to our own political climate now when he says, so I guess the FBI is going to arrest the president too? And Lori replies, sure, why not? And I was thinking we were going to get a crazy fight scene between these three when Looking Glass just hits him with a wrench. And I liked it, actually. It was a fitting end to this arrogant character and a nice moment for Looking Glass to shine and bring justice to the man who ruined his life. And then we close out with the scene I think we were all expecting. Angela cleaning up the eggs and a flashback to a reminder we all apparently needed about Manhattan transferring his powers. And I loved the ending. We get a slow intro of the Beatles song I Am The Walrus coming in at the end, which has the line, See How They Fly, the title of this episode. The song has been one of the most confusing of all of the Beatles songs, and it was, it's was it been very open to interpretation. I think John Lennon said that he wrote it to confuse people. 
And that's what we kind of hear at the end, have here at the end, an open interpretation. It cuts out at the last moment, Inception style, where we aren't sure whether or not Angela now has Dr. Manhattan's powers. And this was actually a tribute to Alan Moore, the writer of the original Watchmen storyline. He ended it by leaving it very open to what happens next. The final lines of the comic are, I leave it entirely in your hands. And I would like to finish this up by reading an excerpt from the Petapedia site of a memo written by Agent Petey, and this was came online last week. And I believe it's meant to be Lindelof's final takeaway from the show, and kind of reveals the mindset I believe he wants his audience to have after watching his series. So it goes, This entire adventure in Tulsa has shown me that I am not the enlightened intellect I thought I was, but remain compromised by blinkered, assumptive, know-it-all thinking. I feel challenged to engage our culture with a more generous and empathetic spirit. So, thanks for watching everyone. Uh, we'll be sure to go through a few more Watchmen videos this week and maybe get some Easter eggs and things like that that I didn't get through here. If you found any Easter eggs of your own, mention them below and I'll, hopefully I'll mention you in that video later on. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to us here at Buzz Talks. Cheers.